all of you are good people. So the bad thing that is happening to all of you is that you have to hear my class. <laughs> Another bad thing is that this mic is too humble. <laughs> <laughs> now it is too proud. <laughs> it needs to be here like this. Okay. <laughs> so, I personally had this question for many years because when I was one I got polio and I just couldn't walk normally and there was still maybe I was six or seven uh, it it was to ignore me I couldn't play like normal with other children and then my parents would always assure me they would say that uh, what they told me never really never really pacified me but when I was in school and there was one friend of mine so I had got full marks in maths at that time and then he had failed completely and then I was trying to explain maths to him it's simple maths and there you have seven waters of difficulty but he just couldn't get it and then I think I was thinking it's so simple he just didn't get it then at that time it struck me that he was not he was not lazy he was not apathetic he just didn't have later on i heard understood the concept of iq but he just didn't have the iq level to understand that maths so it struck me that actually life is unfair to everyone it may be unfair to me in the sense that i have some physical inability but for somebody else it may be intellectual inability and at least in my case, you can say that the, because the disability is visible, so I get some amount of sympathy, some amount of support. People help me to carry my luggage. If I'm slipping, somebody holds me. But if somebody has intellectual inability, people just condemn him. Why are you so? Why are you not like that person? Why are you so lazy? Why are you so incompetent? So it has struck me that actually everyone has some or the other crippling inabilities some people can't just can't speak properly they just start stammering and start to especially when they have to speak in public some people have stage fright so some people everybody if we consider we all have some things which are deficient within us and life is unfair it's unfair to everyone the degree of unfairness may vary from person to person but it is unfair so then that raised the question for me why is it like that so my parents at that time told me that actually whatever god has taken in the taken from you in physical ability he has given you in intellectual ability then it struck me who is this being god who has so much control over my life that he can choose what to give and what to take and of course I was still a child and these questions would come sometimes I would think about them but <clears throat> if you don't get answers to questions you just move on with life it was in my teen it was in my engineering days that I stumbled across the Bhagavad Gita and there for the first time, I got what seemed like a reasonable explanation. That is, that actually we are souls and we have been through many lifetimes. And the situations that we face in this lifetime, they are often the result of what we have done in the previous life. So some people are born wealthy, some people are born poor, some people are born healthy, some people are born sickly. Why is this difference there? So one explanation. Basically, we can have three explanations for this. That things happen by chance and life is terrible. 
if some people are just unlucky like life is like a lottery and some people are losers in the lottery <laughs> so if bad things are happening to you just you are unlucky that's your luck live with it and this is a very disempowering world view because none of us lives like this Now, at least from this life's perspective we try to look for causal connections you know okay if i am falling sick maybe i need to take my diet take care of my diet do some more exercise take some proper medicines and then i i at least act on the assumption that that will heal me so we implicitly accept a cause effect connection and we can't function without cause effect connection so when we accept this cause effect connection in the sense that if somebody comes home with a bruised face this is what happened this is not just the bruise came like that what how oh, bruises don't come like that what happened did you do did you get into what did you do did you get into fight with someone did you hit something so whenever we see an effect we look for a cause and we have this uh, so this is two ways so whenever we already see an effect we presume there must have been a cause for it and we often do actions hoping that it will produce certain effects like if i am sick i take certain medicines hoping that there will be an effect that i'll get healthy by that so we never live without the idea of cause effect we can't function without that so for the small things in our life or for the many things in our life we accept cause effect but for the big things you know what 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 kind of family we are born in a wealthy or a poor family what complexion we are born with dark or fair what iq level we are born with is there no cause effect for that it just doesn't make sense that cause effect to be accept for most of things in our life but for the big things in our life so there's no cause effect how does that make sense so one explanation that it's by chance the other explanation is what is offered by the abrahamic religions the abrahamic religions are judaism christianity and islam they all accept abraham as the one of the prophets so these say that all that happens in this world is by god's will that means that god made somebody poor that god gave somebody low iq that god made somebody crippled that god made somebody with uh, some learning disabilities is it so then why would god be discriminate like this and if god is discriminate like this then how can we devote ourselves to such a discriminatory god if we have to devote ourselves we can devote ourselves to a person who is virtuous who is fair who is compassionate if god is so discriminatory and so arbitrary how can we worship or devote ourselves to such a god so in many ways it is this belief that 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 god that whatever has happened in the world is god's will and we have to accept it this makes atheism seem more more say it seem more preferable than theism no better than believe a god who is so unfair and arbitrary is to believe that there is no god so atheism increases when if we, if among these are the only two options we have that things happen by chance or things happen by god's because god wants them like that then better accept chance cause so but there is a third possibility the third possibility is that things happen neither by chance nor by god's will they happen by our own past actions if they happen by our own past actions that means that we from our past lives did certain good actions certain bad actions and those have accumulated and they created the conditions in our life and some of us have some good conditions some bad conditions that's because of our own past karma and this understanding it both reconciles on one side our implicit acceptance of cause and effect that we do accept cause and effect yes and cause effect connection is there it doesn't deny that and secondly it also accepts 
that you know god is fair it is not god who is causing the bad things to happen to us it is our own bad actions you are giving bad reactions so this is the basic answer that i got from the bhagavad gita of why bad things happen to good people that's because we ourselves have done certain bad things in the past so as i said i wanted to keep this a short class so i'll stop over here are there any questions which anyone would like to ask yes please okay Okay. So is there any evidence that uh, there is a past life from which something like this has come? It depends on what we mean by the word evidence. Mm -hmm. If you want hard evidence mm -hmm. that in terms of say mathematical logic or observable facts or like a mathematical reading in an instrument, we don't have that. It's like suppose somebody asks does your mother love you what do you think of course you may say why ask a question you are insulting my mother by asking a question like that <laughs> of course my mother loves me ask what is the scientific proof that your mother loves you <laughs> well you cannot give a scientific proof for that there is no mathematical equation just is proved now so what we can do is inference now i can talk about hundreds of incidents the only reasonable inference from all those incidents is that my mother loves me that's why she did like this that's why she did like this that's why she did like this so when we talk about evidence with for many important things in our life we don't have hard evidence like either facts or mathematically rigorous proofs what we have is inferences so similarly with respect to past lives what we can do is look at it from a inferential perspective do can is this a reasonable inference that <clears throat> there are certain things which we can see and know and that within what we see and know some things we can explain and some things we can't explain or rather to put it another way sometimes to explain the observable we postulate something that is unobservable say for example newton saw the fruit falling which fruit was it apple, apple. apple. that time there were no apple computers otherwise people would have been confused <laughs> <laughs> what fell down then? <laughs> so and the apple fell down some people say it fell in front of him some people say it fell on his head <laughs> wherever it fell so he all that he saw was the observation but how do i explain this what makes this apple fall so to explain an observable phenomena he came up with an unobservable principle gravity is unobservable you cannot observe gravity you can observe the effects of gravity so so, so so the from the falling of the of apple you could say that in inference is there is gravity so similarly if there were a past life hmm, uh, okay let's start with another way uh, that we see differences in the world right now hmm. so how do we explain those inference differences so we postulate something invisible to explain something visible so the differences that we see in people now a reasonable explanation for that could be that they have acted differently in their previous lives now if you want to be more precise about this we can consider twins twins i was in london I was giving a talk and i mentioned this point and one person in the audience got up so i said talking about there are certain twins you are called as identical twins monozygotic twins their genes are exactly same not just nearly same exactly same and yet these two twins who are identical 
are not identical. They are genetically identical, but their personal, the personality wise, different. So what makes them different? Their biology is fully the same. There is something beyond the biology in their personality that accounts for their difference. Further, so again, this is an observation. What's the inference? Like I said, how do I know my mother loves me? Oh, that night I was so sick. And my mother, she took me a hospital, at a hospital, although she herself was sick. Or when my treatment was needed, she was ready to sell her own ornaments to get money for that. There are multiple, uh, multiple incidents. The only reasonable inference from those incidents is my mother loves me. So like that, first is the inequities of life itself. Why are they there? Then the difference among identical twins. And third could be the scientifically researched past life memories. There are many stories, many or case studies rather, of scientists who have found out children who suddenly remember their past lives. Hare Krishna, what is your name? Abhinav. Abhinav Krishna. Oh yeah, we have met the other day. Okay. How old are you, Abhinav? Ten. Ten. Oh, you're too old. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Who is there? Oh, Hare Krishna. What is it? How old is he? He's five. Five. Okay. He's also old. <laughs> <laughs> no. Why I'm saying too old? Sometimes there are children who are just three or four years old, and suddenly they come to their mom, mom. Where's my other mom? <laughs> What? <laughs> then they say, I want to go and meet my other mom. What do you mean by other mom? And then they start, they start insisting, they have precise recollections of their, pa of their past lives when they had another mother. And if they take taken to that place, they have recognitions. They recognize, oh, this is my mother, this is my brother, this is my sister. They also remember, this is the place where I lived, this is the place where I played. And there are behaviors. There are behaviors which are similar to how they would have behaved. There was this case of a boy named Titu who claimed to be Rajiv, Rajiv Sharma from a previous life. And he said, I own an electrical shop named it was Rajiv Varma, Varma Electricals. And this four year old boy, he said, I have a wife. <laughs> and her name is Nita. And then he went to send his, his relatives went and saw that there was actually a Varma Electrical Studio and it was run by a widow named by the same name. And then he went there and he recognized her. And now this, this guy's children from a previous life were older than this boy. But when he went there, he started fondling their hair as if they were his children. And he treated this old woman, reasonably older woman who was, never he had seen, he treated her like she was his wife. And not only that, he had been killed in a murder attack. He had been killed in a murder attack. So at point blank, he had been shot when he had returned from his home in a car. So the bullet had entered from one side and gone out from the other side. So at the place where the bullet entry and exit wounds were there, the post-mortem report showed, at that exact same place, this T2, his name was, name was T2 in this life, he had prominent birthmarks. So birthmarks at the entry point, birthmark at the exit point. And the birthmark at the exit point was slightly larger. When the bullet goes out, it becomes, because of the trajectory, it causes more damage. And it's not just one case, there are hundreds, there are scores of cases like this across all continents. So this has no explanation, no reasonable inference other than that there's a, there's a person who lived previously and has moved here. Okay, so like that, so from multiple evidence, multiple observations, we can make a reasonable inference that we have had previous lives. Okay? Any other questions? Mm. Okay, Prabhuji, thank you so much for, for a nice talk. And, um, so you started by saying why bad things happen to good people. Um, and then we came to past life. It feels so hopeless and helpless to see that my past life is dictating me. It's, it feels so hopeless to be pre-programmed. Were you pre-programmed to ask this question? <laughs> <laughs> so, 
are we so somebody asked me a question once that you know well we don't have any free will we are all controlled by our past says so then i replied i also don't have the free will to answer this question <laughs> 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 so yes mm. actually our past determines our situations it does not determine our decisions it determines our situations not our decisions it's like if we are driving mm. the kind of car that we are driving the kind of weather and traffic that we will encounter that is determined but how we drive the car is up to us so similarly our body is like our car ishvara sarva bhutanam hridayeshe arjuna tishtati brahmayan sarva bhutani yantra rudhani mayaya so krishna says we are all on this yantra the body is like a machine on which we are all situated so this machine the kind of car that we have that is determined by our past karma like i said earlier our complexion our height i don't know exactly our height yes, genetically also our height is often fixed our nationality our iq levels these may be fixed the kind of car we have is fixed and also the kind of conditions that we will meet when we are driving the car good weather bad weather heavy traffic light traffic that that is also fixed but how we drive the car is up to us so our driving ability is something which you can learn and improve So therefore, our choices, our circumstances may be determined by our past, but our choices are determined by our present. And so, it's therefore it's not hopeless, because we can always choose in our situations. And if we choose wisely, then we can. Somebody might have a very uh, slow-moving, noisy car, but if they drive carefully, they can reach their destination safely. somebody may have a fast shiny big car but if they drink and drive no they will reach the graveyard not their destination <laughs> isn't it so our past determines our situations not our decisions we are not programmed does it answer your question okay, thank you yeah okay we'll come to you now we can you know ask then we can come to you Yes. Hare Krishna, bro. Thank you so much. Um, when you started saying why bad thing happens to good people, that's like a age-old question, and then everyone bad goes through that. Especially when you are going out and talk to people, this is very common one that is being asked. Um, this, the answers are exactly what you said, and we also try to tell people that there is something governing the world. There are laws. but when a devotee goes through some situation which is um, i'm actually personally encountering that right now uh, one of my devotee friends son who is 20 year old left the body and uh, while he was going through his recovery from blood cancer leukemia my friend really <coughs> tried very much you know praying to krishna and saving him and he was like trying to um, like come up with a story that okay krishna saved my son uh, at the end something like that will happen and because that did not happen he is coming up with this um you know notion of why krishna is so um cruel and didn't save my son and my son was so much of a nice devotee he did everything he could he went to mayapur this so how do we i mean in one sense we understand krishna does best for you when you are when you are trying to serve him but on the other hand when somebody is leaving the body or some atrocities that they go through we cannot really say that right that happens good for you yeah. or something like that yeah okay so i just want to share that and see okay. what you think i can tell my friend thank you yeah thank you so if somebody has lost their young son and they prayed to krishna and hope that some intervention will happen but it didn't then they start thinking that god is cruel so how do we explain that time yes there are sometimes 
or for giving an explanation and there are sometimes for giving support we shouldn't think that every situation is a situation for giving explanations so if we consider something similar happened in the mahabharat abhimanyu was just a 16 year old boy and he was killed brutally he was a hero and he was unfairly killed by six warriors and abhimanyu uh, when abhimanyu was killed arjuna was shattered and arjuna he lashed out at his brothers he said are all your ornaments just bang are all your weapons just bangles could any of you not protect your brother and then he turned and lashed out at krishna also krishna you must have known what why didn't you tell me and he was furious and at that time krishna did not say that everything that happens is good krishna didn't say don't question my will what krishna said was oh, oh arjuna your brothers loved abhimanyu as much as you loved them he was not just your son he was the son of all of us mero your brothers are in as much grief as you are please don't speak words that increase their grief we are all in this together and then as arjuna heard that whole story you know he came to a conclusion the conclusion was that jayadrath and then his brothers told him that we had a plan that he would break into the chakravyu and then we will follow and then we would all that was the plan to save our army from being devoured by the chakravyu but then jayadrath came in when jayadrath came in that was the time we couldn't go in and he deliberately stopped us then arjuna decided jayadrath is the cause and he so in such a evil way plotted so that my son would be separated from his helpers that's how he was plotted then arjuna directed his anger towards jayadrath so what is happening in this is that this anything that happens we can put it in different causal boxes causal box means cause and effect this is a box so for example right now if this mic stops stops working then i could put in a causal box hey, did i touch the button over here by accident they turned off that could be one causal box the other could be that has somebody as this mic itself could become defective third could be that oh has somebody switched off the power or the fourth could be that maybe the power supply in this whole area has broken down the fifth could be maybe america has been attacked by terror terrorists and all the power plants in america have been broken down stopped or so now every event could be extrapolated or rather could be put in various causal boxes so now if imagine if in your house you have someone and the light goes off and they start saying hey america hey america is attacked by terrorists he says what happened to what's wrong with you why are you being paranoid like that so if we if we escalate something to too large a causal box then we can't function constructively like so to be intelligent to be able to function intelligently in the world we need to place things in the most constructive causal box not necessarily right or wrong causal box most constructive so if the mic is stopped working then the most constructive causal box could be that maybe this mic is switched off or maybe this mic is defective let's start with the most constructive causal box is yes, and then move upward so similarly now if we consider sickness now if there is a causal box in which we are going to put, 
okay, why did the sickness come? Why did the sickness not get cured? Now, we could see somehow how it works is that like I, I, read, I read a book which was like a comedy book in which the author in his acknowledgement said that everything right in this book, everything good about this book is because of me and everything bad about this book is because of my editor. <laughs> so, <laughs> now that is why he was joking of course, but it is a very self-serving way of looking at things. So similarly, <laughs> so when something bad has happened to someone, not do we need to each time escalate it to the God box that you know, okay, why did this disease occur? Well, because cancer is just so widely prevalent in today's world and with that cancer is not yet been cured. It is not that just because we are devotees, we expect Krishna to change the rules of the game for us. That is not bhakti. That is not that. At that, there are certain rules of the game. Is it that now Arjuna did not ask Krishna, Krishna, I am your devotee, so why do I have to fight? You just defeat all my enemies. Now Arjuna fought wholeheartedly. So, if we think that the purpose of bhakti is to get God to change the rules of the game for us, then we will soon be disappointed. The purpose of bhakti is to get us to get us God's blessing so that we can play the game better. But the rules of the game will not change. It's like say suppose somebody has diabetes and then there is gulab jamun prasad. And they take gulab jamun, oh this is prasad, how can I say no? And then they get a diabetic attack. He says it was prasad. You say prasad is spiritual. Well, the rice dal chapati was also spiritual, isn't it? <laughs> Why did you take the gulab jamun only then? So, we don't expect Krishna to change the rules of the game. So, at a material level, things happen at material cause and effect is there. So, it is not that if somebody is sick and we pray, necessarily God will intervene. And if God doesn't intervene, that doesn't make God cruel. There are things which happen in life and okay, why did you get this disease? Sometimes just some diseases like, they just don't know the cause of those diseases. But we try the treatment, if it doesn't work, what can we do? You see, generally, whenever anything good happens to us, we don't very often escalate to God's level. How did you succeed? I worked so hard. I sacrificed so much. <laughs> Why did you fail? Fate is so cruel. <laughs> well, it is said that success has many parents and failure is an orphan. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's, it's difficult. But I think uh, if you understand that so basically, what happened, and I'll complete this answer. We may not be able to say all this to that person. Yeah. But what I'm saying is, Krishna also did not give a philosophical explanation over there. Krishna just was there with him to support him. And then Arjuna himself placed that event in the most constructive context. The most constructive context was, this Jayadrath was responsible for the death of my brother's son. So I'll bring him down. And the next day, now, it was the worst day for the Kauravas because Arjuna was infuriated and they brought their whole army to stop him from reaching Jayadrath and still Krishna, Arjuna penetrated through it all. So we need to help others. Our purpose should never be to thrust our philosophy down someone who is, who is down. You know, our philosophy, our purpose should be to help people arrive at the most constructive explanation for that situation. So, 
if somebody's son has unfortunately passed away like this then you maybe you said that now so you love your son but at a physical level he is not there with you 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 can't do anything for him but his soul is still there if you pray for him if you worship him if you do some bhakti for him you can still benefit his soul so that is a constructive frame of reference to put it in or you could say that you know that all oh, this cancer is incurable maybe i'll become a cancer researcher or i'll support cancer research or you could put it in some other constructive framework that you know actually you know there are there are cures for cancer but they're not so well known if i had known about this cure maybe we would have tried it so we have to find out within our situation what is the most constructive frame of reference one constructive frame of reference could be that you know that we are in this world we have relationships the relationships in this world are temporary and we also need an eternal relationship so we have to find help them find the most constructive frame of reference in which they can place that situation okay thank you yes okay Hare Krishna Prabhu. Uh, thank you so much for a nice class. Uh, my it was nice is, because it was so short. <laughs> <laughs> uh, open discussion. So, uh, I mean, it's good to have open discussion. Right? Yes. So my question is, uh, due to our past life, you are uh, having some negative uh, situations in your in your life in this life. So, uh, anyways, um, we cannot skip those uh, negative situations, right? So, how do we overcome of that situation? Stay positive and think positive. Okay. So, we cannot escape the situations from our past life. So, how do we stay positive? See, broadly, any situation we are in, no situation takes away our power to do three things. I call it. open a new tab in your life say if you are working on a computer and some some horrible scene comes up on that computer and then we just open a new tab i don't want to see this i'll see something else so tab is the first it's an acronym thoughts attitude and behavior that whatever situation we are in it doesn't control what we think about hmm? Yes, there is a problem, and we have to think about it to see if we, how much how we can deal with it. But we don't have to constantly keep thinking about the problem. So, if we can turn our thoughts towards something more constructive, ultimately we can turn our thoughts towards Krishna. I am sick, and I'm on my bed. Suppose I am bedridden because of I got a fracture. Now I can think about oh how unfair this fracture is, how everyone else is enjoying, and I am suffering over here. i feel sorry for myself and i start snapping at others i become irritable and some people are sick and they make their caregivers sick of them <laughs> so instead of that so thinking about myself and how what a sorry situation i am in if i turn to think about krishna maybe hear about krishna sing about krishna read about krishna think about something constructive i am physically restricted but nobody controls what i think we always have the power to choose our thoughts not 100% because we have to think about our situations also but we don't have to constantly keep thinking about our situations so what we think about is in our control then a is attitude attitude is uh, with what attitude we look at that situation we can say that life is terrible uh, life is terrible life is unfair and we'll just feel sorry for ourselves or we can look at it with a spiritually positive attitude a spiritually positive attitude means that you know this is i didn't address that point in your question uh, sometimes we say that everything that happens is good now there is this gita sar which many of you may have seen uh, which people put in their shops and other places So one of the things they say is, जो हुआ वो अच्छा हुआ, जो हो रहा है वो अच्छा हो रहा है, जो होगा वो भी अच्छा भी हो, वो वो भी अच्छा ही होगा. Whatever happened is good, whatever is happening is good, whatever will happen will be good. Now I have read the Gita hundreds of times, and I have not found any verse like this in the Gita. 
<laughs> the Gita is not so much talking about what happens to us. It talks more about what we do. So, the Gita doesn't say that everything that happens is good. But what it does indicate is that everything that happens can be for good. It is not that everything that happens automatically is good. Bad people do bad things and that's bad. It's not necessarily a good thing. But even from the bad, good can come. So the, the universe ultimately moves purposefully. So what does this attitude mean? Let's say if we are in a situation of order and then from order suddenly chaos comes up. What is that? What does that mean? That means say now all of you are sitting here. And order means when we do something and we get the expected result. So you ask a question and you get a reasonable answer. Suppose you ask a question and suddenly the person sitting next to you slaps you in the face. <laughs> hey, what happened? Isn't it? That would be chaos. What happened? So when we do something and something entirely unexpected happens, that's chaos. So often our life moves from order to chaos. When it moves from order to chaos, a spiritually positive attitude means from that chaos, a higher order will come. That chaos is there now, I can't deny it. But if I act properly, if I grow, if I act purposefully, from that chaos, order will come. It's like, uh, say, a woman is pregnant. Now, when the baby is inside her womb, it's order. The mother is taking care of the baby and she is feeding the baby is fed. But then, the, the labor pains start. It's chaos. You now suddenly what pain from where? But if the mother tolerates, if the mother keeps pushing and then gradually the baby emerges, then there's a better order. A new life is born. So order, chaos, order. So we don't deny the chaos that is there in our life. But we, a spiritually positive attitude means from the chaos a higher order will emerge. So now, to give another example for this, which will relate to my third point. So, thoughts, attitude, and third is B's behavior. What we think about is up to us. With what attitude we look at our situation is also up to us. No, the situation doesn't control that. And how we behave is also up to us. How we behave means that we may say, no, the situation doesn't allow me. Like if I am fractured, if if I have a fracture and I am bedridden, he says. I can't, I, what, what, my behavior is controlled, I can't go anywhere. But we are never as powerless as we think. Hmm? No matter how bad the situation may be, it, it, it never takes away our power. No situation can take away our power to make that situation worse. <laughs> That means I may be I may be fracture I may have a fracture in one foot and I may be bedridden, but I can take a hammer and fracture my other foot also. <laughs> now what this means is that if I can make things worse, then I can also make things better. I'm not as powerless as you think. So now I might be able to do it in a small way. Small way is that. Okay, while I'm in my bed, maybe let me do a little exercise so that my leg does not atrophy. So in that situation, start with small, simple steps. What we, If we look at our own lives, immediately we can list three things which we can do and we should be doing but we are not doing. And we know if I do these things, I can make my life better. And I can list three things which we should not be doing what you are doing and that is making our life worse. We are not talking about big changes, small things are doable. Just start with that. So we can all take small simple steps to create a better situation for ourselves. Maybe this small simple step, one step we can take is always you know, turn toward Krishna, pray to Krishna. 
But along with that, we can also do something practical. So even if we take small, small steps, we can create a better situation for ourselves. So this open a new tab in our life that how we think, how we act, how, how, with what attitude we see and how we behave. No situation controls that. We can choose that always. And by opening a new tab, we can create a brighter future for us, no matter how bleak our present may be. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Hare Krishna Prabhuji, thank you so much. So in the uh, Mahabharata instance that you spoke about Abhimanyu, I think uh, Lord Krishna had given Abhimanyu how to <coughs> enter the chakra view while he was in uh, Subhadra's womb. But he had purposely not explained how to get out of it. And if he wanted, he could have saved Abhimanyu. So why did he, you know, not tell him how to exit and why did he not save Abhimanyu? What's the story behind that? Okay, is it that Krishna did not deliberately give the knowledge to Abhimanyu and that's how Abhimanyu was killed? Well, that's not exactly the story. It was Arjuna who was speaking to Subhadra, not Krishna. And Subhadra did the mistake we all do commonly. She went to sleep during a class. <laughs> 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 so, Arjuna was, Subhadra had asked, you know, how do you break a chakra view? Now for her, it is more like a casual curiosity. She was not going to fight and get into chakra view. But Abhimanyu inside her womb was also hearing. And Arjuna was speaking, but after some she probably had worked very hard on that day or whatever. She nodded off. And Arjuna was speaking, speaking, and then he looked, oh, she's gone to sleep. So he stopped speaking. So then he stopped speaking, so Abhimanyu heard half the story. And Abhimanyu was just 16. So nobody thought that he would ever need to use Chakraview knowledge. So others could have taught him, but at that time, the six, he was 16, and just that he didn't, he didn't know about it. Now, was all this Krishna's plan That's very difficult to know. Mm. Okay. Uh, let, me, let me complete this. That I take another incident. That before the Kurukshetra war, when Vyasadeva and other sages come and tell Dhritarashtra that please stop your son from antagonizing the Pandavas. If he doesn't give the Pandavas kingdom back to them, there will be a terrible war and your whole dynasty will be destroyed. So at that time, uh, Vyasadeva tells him, now, Dhritarashtra says, actually, isn't, isn't everything determined by destiny? Maybe this war is also the will of destiny. And if that is so, then what can I do? So Vyasadeva becomes very grave. And he says, the workings of destiny are very difficult for us to know. What we can know is our duty. So contemplate deeply, O Dhritarashtra, what is your duty in this situation and act accordingly. Now, after the war gets over and all his hundred sons are killed, and Dhritarashtra is lamenting terribly. At that time, Vyasadeva again comes to him. And Vyasadeva tells him that, Oh, Dhritarashtra, do not lament. This war was the will of destiny. Now, what's going on over here? <laughs> Earlier he said destiny is very difficult to know, but now he says it was the will of destiny. So the point over here is, philosophy doesn't exist in isolation from context. Ultimately, the purpose of all philosophy is to help us to act in the most constructive way. So when something is going to happen in the future and when we are to choose some action, then we need to act in the, to the best of our capacity. 
that's why at that time he said you don't know what is destiny but you know, you know, know what is your duty and act according but now something has already happened now which we keep thinking about is oh maybe i should not maybe i should stop my son maybe why didn't i stop the duryodhan that lamentation will simply waste his energy so then he's telling you okay it has happened already it's happened see it as the will of destiny and move on so so then was the war krishna's plan or was it not krishna's plan here you have to understand that everything that happens may not be god's plan but god's plan can act through everything that happens are you getting the difference that it was not that krishna's plan that durudan should be so evil it was not a krishna's plan that dushyas and disrob dropadi but they did those terrible things now god is so expert it's like say in a cricket match if a captain is very expert now he has one bowler who is supposed to bowl very well but that bowler has a very bad bowling as is bowling very badly hmm? and that bowler is being beaten everywhere and now that batsman has, the, the captain has a plan the captain's being this player is not playing the play is not playing the part but then the captain sees that this opposing player is hitting one after another and is becoming a very overconfident now and then he expertly brings another bowler who just bowls in a way that deceives that batsman that batsman who has become more confident and their plan was to get that bowler that's been out this bowler couldn't do it but the captain did that plan through another bowler now resourceful captains can do that that even if the like, plan a doesn't work they have a plan b so like that we we shouldn't have to think we don't have to think of krishna's plan like one fixed line it is one direction one purpose hmm? so it is not that everything that everyone does is as per krishna's plan we are not puppets we all have free will and sometimes some people use abuse their free will terribly but still even if some people abuse their free will still that doesn't mean that they will thwart krishna's plan krishna is so expert that through it all he will execute his plan still so therefore the point over here was that he was telling dhritarashtra that at this point before the war think what what your responsibility is but now the war is over your sons are dead don't lament over it that now look at what your duty is except that that has happened as the will of destiny and move on in your life So, so applying this to our context, now we go uh, the way the Mahabharat analyzes it is that Abhimanyu's death was because of Jayadrath's deviousness, and Krishna goes along with that explanation. So, bad, when bad things happen in the world, is it Krishna's will? That's that's a difficult question to answer. Krishna doesn't want anyone to suffer. Sometimes there is necessary suffering. uh just like when somebody has to go through surgery but that doesn't mean any cut inflicted on anyone is a surgery <laughs> there is some suffering that is necessary but that doesn't mean any suffering that is caused by anyone is actually god's will if some if i go and insult you hey, why do you insult me no actually this insult is good for you to develop humility <laughs> i cannot rationalize my action like that isn't it so if i am abusing my action i'm my free will i am responsible but the point is krishna can act through anyone's actions but that krishna can further his plan through anyone's actions or despite anyone's actions also but that doesn't mean everyone's action is krishna's plan so rather than so this particular story at least we have not heard, i not heard about it at least for krishna not speaking it partially it is circumstance that Uh, Arjuna spoke and Subhadra did not hear fully, but she is not to be responsible, and Arjuna is also not responsible. It is Jayadrath who is considered responsible over here. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I think there is one question which everyone has: When will this class end? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so should we stop? Mm -hmm. Can you say a little bit about <coughs> Bhagavatam and Bhadrapurnima? It's coming okay, up. The sure. significance. Yeah. It's on Friday this week.